participating today, you'll hear the, the information live. Uh, for folks who are going to be uh, in need of the information at a later date, we will have all of it available for you for future reference. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, Face Conformance Program Overview webinar. Uh, my name is Judy Serenzia. I'm from the Open Group, and I am the Program Director for the Future Airborne Capability Environment Face Consortium. Uh, we have two additional presenters today. We have Marcel Padilla, uh, who represents NAVAIR, who will be giving us a uh, technical overview, executive overview about the, uh, the face technical standard and some details about um, what sections and segments of the standard that you would need to conform to. And uh, we have uh, Steve Getz, who represents U.S. Army AMRDEC, who will be giving you information about the, the policies, documents, uh, process that you go through for face conformance and how to get more information not only about the process and the steps, uh, but how to contact our various verification, certification, and library administrator authorities who comprise the face conformance program as well. So with that, we will get started. Uh, Simon, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the future airborne capability environment, uh, we are a government industry collaborative organization. Uh, we operate under the umbrella of the Open Group, which is a uh, global consortium who focuses on uh, achieving business objectives through the use of open standards. Uh, the FACE consortium, uh, FA the FACE approach is a government industry software standard and business strategy uh, that we are using uh, to enable uh, folks to acquire affordable software systems. Uh, rapidly integrate portable capabilities across global defense programs, and attract innovation and deploy it quickly and affordably. We want to change the current business model from develop once, uh, charge 10 times, uh, pay uh, multiple times for um, similar capability with proprietary wrappers on multiple aircraft to the point where we have uh, reusable, portable, interoperable software that uh, government and customers can use to uh, procure differently, and software suppliers can expand into a horizontal market and be more innovative in how to uh, strategize their software across multiple product lines uh, to support uh, the warfighter and give more capability to the warfighter faster. I did mention that we're developed through an industry and government collaboration through the Open Group uh, Face Consortium. Uh, we have 90 plus member organizations uh, participating and over 1,100 individual participants on our roster. Uh, we've grown uh, exponentially over the past six years and uh, very proud of the fact that we are now in a position to put the business strategy in place in order to enable the standard and the uh, adoption and uptake of the standard to uh, propagate to the customer, uh, which is uh, right now uh, government, military, aircraft, and software industry. Next slide. So the benefits to government by developing an open standard using a collaborative environment between government and industry is uh, to meet the better buying power needs uh, that are called out as, as a lot of the directives from the U.S. government. Um, better buying power enables us to increase competition, achieve affordability, and control the overall life cycle costs of uh, the multiple programs for the various aircraft that are out there for Army, Navy, Air Force, um, some international communities as well. Uh, we want to incentivize productivity and innovation in industry and government and ultimately reduce software development times, uh, saving time and money uh, through modularity and portability. Uh, it also allows for cross-program or cross-platform decision-making. Uh, reuse is one of the, the primary tenets of the, the FACE approach. Uh, reuse applications across multiple platforms without any cross-platform dependencies. Don't invest multiple times for the same capability and enable integration of cross-program requirements. Next slide. Uh, industry benefits as well. Uh, it, the FACE uh, approach enables industry to create uh, software-centric product line market opportunities so they can develop capability once and use it for multiple customers across multiple platforms. And it also provides the opportunity for software capability across multiple aircraft types, which may not have been available to them before when they were um, just supplying product for one customer. This enables them to get into uh, a market where multiple customers can benefit from the capability that they have. Uh, it also lowers their cost of doing business. Uh, 
common standards allow for lower cost and schedule risk. Uh, if it's developed once, um, the QA quality uh, assurance is done once. And uh, if it's proven to work once, it's proven to work in multiple environments. Standardization also allows for rapid development of capabilities. And reuse of software enables integrators to optimize platform performance. So if they've tested it once, they've integrated it once, integrated it once the learning curve goes down and folks can uh, do things more rapidly, again, with the ultimate goal of getting high quality capability to the warfighter faster and in a more cost effective way. Next slide. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, where you can find more information about the FACE approach. Uh, we do have a landing page, www.opengroup.org slash FACE, which is our public facing site. We also have a website that we use for collaboration among our members. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining the FACE consortium, finding out more how to participate, uh, we can give you a little bit more information about that at the end of the webinar. But the landing, the landing page will give you information about consortium activities, uh, membership, uh, information about the uh, public documents and tools that we use to support developing uh, FACE software and uh, some of the things that are out there available. The FACE technical standard, we've got edition 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, 2.1, and various related documents that are associated with that. We have a reference guide reference implementation guide for each edition of the technical standard. Uh, we also have a uh, conformance verification matrix that's associated with each edition of the standard and a data model that's available to uh, correspond to editions 2.0 and 2.1 of the FACE technical standard. Uh, in addition to that, we have some of the conformance policy documents, uh, conformance guidance documents, information about library requirements, and information about business guidance, as well as the, uh, the FACE contract guide, which will enable uh, customers to find information about how to procure uh, FACE conformance software, and suppliers uh, to find information about how to put contract language together to offer FACE conformance software in response to an RFI or an RFP. Uh, all of this has been put into place not only to document the technical standard and guidance for how to develop software so that it, um, it meets the requirements that are defined in the technical standard, but also the business strategy and tools techniques so that government can procure and uh, industry can provide uh, face conformance software in, in a, a mechanism and in a language that, uh, that meets contract requirements. Uh, I, our big announcement is that we are live and ready for business. Uh, the FACE conformance program has all of the pieces and parts in place. Uh, we have the documentation in place. We have our conformance authorities in place. The verification authorities who will run through for the record testing of uh, the conformance test suite and some of the other tools that we have for developing and testing that uh, the software does meet FACE conformance requirements. Uh, we have the FACE certification authority in place who can uh, confirm that all of the testing was done correctly and can uh, ensure that all of the legal agreements are signed and um, ensure that a certificate is issued to prove that software is conformant to the standard. And then we have the library administer, administrator in place who can uh, confirm that Software that has gone through verification that has been certified as conformant is listed in the registry. And the only way that we 100% guarantee that software is certified face conformant is if it completes all three steps. So listing it in the registry is the last step of the game. And uh, we're very, very happy that we have all three of the authorities in place. Uh, and our, our panelists that are coming up later will give you more detail about the technical aspect and about uh, the authorities and some of the processes that are in place and procedures that are in place in order to enable making that happen. Next slide. So some of you may be wondering, why does it matter? And I will, I will go into a little bit of detail here about why it matters. Um, you can have a technical standard. You can have organizations that work very hard on developing a technical standard. And you can have zero customers that are interested in 
using any of the capability that's built based on the technical standard. Uh, what we would like to see happening here, we want to make sure that we have vendors who have invested in doing it right. Uh, there are customers who are very interested in seeing face conformance software. There are customers who are very interested in seeing that commonality, reusability, interoperability on most of their aircraft. And we want to make sure that the software that is produced to conform to the face technical standard does indeed conform and it is, and it is interoperable and it is portable and it is reusable. So by certifying that vendors have gone through the process and have completed all of, all of the steps, it identifies who has invested in doing it right. It's a delineator between who is making claims that they're face conformant, who is making claims that they're certified, and who has actually done the job. And by having the, the product listed in the face registry, it, it gives you a way to check. You're either conformant or you're not. Um, it also lets customers buy with confidence. Uh, conformance has been proven by a third party and they do not have to go out and spend or invest additional money or do any inv additional investigation because it has been verified and the, the vendor is going to warrant that it's going to stay conformant until, um, you know, for the life cycle of the product. And if it's found to be not conformant, they are warranting that they're going to fix it so that they make it right so that it can be reusable and interoperable. And when we realize the value when customers make their choices based on certified conformance. So we want to see products populated in the face library. We want to see choices available for customers to pick and choose among face conformance software so that they have a place to go to get reusable software. They have a place to go where they have confidence that what they, they buy is going to meet their needs because the requirements have been vetted, the requirements have been um, included in procurements, and the customers have supplied products that do meet those needs. Uh, it gives vendors a place to provide a, market a marketplace of conformant products so that they get the word out that my product is out there, I am face conformant, I, I match the APIs, I've done all my testing, I, you can choose my product and have confidence that uh, the integration cost will be reduced, uh, the time to field will be reduced, and ultimately, again, it's, it's back to getting capability to our warfighters faster. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, we have Marcel Padilla from Navair, who is going to give a little bit of background on why we started not only with a technical standard uh, for avionics on military aircraft, uh, but also some background about the business strategy that is going to enable us to adopt that standard and get capability to the warfighter by generating face conformant products. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Marcel. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide, Simon. Or I will try. All right, so uh, when we started this project, uh, we realized that back in the early 60s and 70s that we were building avionics systems and aircraft, and they were uh, um, very uh, purpose-built, um, and that allowed us to give the industry um, developers uh, freedom to develop whatever needed to happen to, in a very expeditious way, and at the time, there was no um, constraints on finances or money. Um, that resulted in uh, proprietary solutions at uh, multiple layers within an architecture, uh, as described in the uh, in the left uh, display on this on this slide. Um, along in the 80s comes the iPhone, which is an innovative approach. Uh, and then, while some people will say the iPhone is a closed um, uh, system, it actually has opened up quite an open architecture on the application side uh, by them. Um, rigorously defining an, an application interface and then providing tools for people to develop applications independently that can be uh, um, loaded, downloaded, and uh, integrated onto that uh, device. However, the way to manage that, uh, the, um, the company has custom middleware and operating system and hardware uh, to make sure that the 
that the supporting infrastructure was consistent. Um, and then um, because of that, um, that was creating such a competition market that uh, some of the phone providers were losing um, ability to compete. Um, so coupled with um, Google, they formed a consortium to develop the Android operating system, which is a custom middleware and operating system combined. Um, and they uh, also allowed to open up the application space uh, by defining an application interface and tools to develop to that. But they also opened up the, what we call the bottom side to the hardware to allow the, um, the phone and small device uh, providers to create hardware and compete in that market. So um, while uh, iPhone still has um, a large portion of the uh, market share as far as uh, revenue, uh, Android has taken over a lot of the market share uh, for the actual devices. Uh, when we started the FACE Consortium, uh, because of the government's rules for open competition in all cases, we wanted to make sure that we had open competition in every uh, portion of the system, which included applications, middleware, operating system, and hardware. Now, FACE itself, the standard does not address hardware. The intent here is that we address the ability to abstract software from hardware to allow hard, uh, uh, any hardware to compete in that market, but we are not defining hardware interfaces. So traditional approach, I mentioned a little bit on the previous slide, each platform, um, Avionics platform had to develop the unique software and the mission sets and boxes and integrate them independently. Um, so what it ended up with, as you see on the left side of the screen, uh, four aircraft might need the same uh, equipment, but it had to be integrated three different times, and each one of those would have a different software load because only portions of those systems were required for each of the aircraft based on their mission set. Um, this caused a lot of uh, integration cost, and as you see, multiple integration efforts. Um, with the uh, a FACE approach, we would like to be able to develop those uh, capabilities such as survivability and uh, sensors and uh, terrain awareness one time and utilize the FACE uh, software architecture to um, minimize the integration um, that would have to happen uh, one time for each platform uh, by taking that uh, capability and reusing it and only uh, changing the software that was needed to integrate it. This will uh, uh, allow cross-platform uh, decision-making uh, because we can have common capabilities across platforms and thus lower acquisition costs for not having to purchase the same capability multiple times. When we started the FACE Consortium, we established these objectives and they've been um, uh, persistent throughout the six years of our uh, life. Uh, we we wanted to establish a common operating environment to support portability, uh, portable capability-based applications across the Department of Defense avionics system. Since then, we've realized that our, uh, our software architecture approach is not constrained to DOD avionics system, and it's just good software business practices. The rules that we set upon ourselves was we needed to determine a strict set of open standards to establish this environment based on the uh, principles of open architecture, integrated modular avionics, and uh, MOSA, the modular open systems approach. And some of the attributes of our architectural approach should include portability, modularity, partitioned, scalable, extendable, and secure. Why did we need to do this? There was a dem demand from the customer to reduce lifecycle costs and time to field. How are we gonna do this? We had to obtain industry and and DOD program management endorsement, which is why we entered into a consortium, government industry consortium. And lastly, we we're going to finally um, come with the hammer that many standards do not bring, which is we need the conformance to ensure that the requirements have been met to maximize the interoperability and portability that the standard was defining. So I'll go into the technical overview now. The technical strategy was quite similar, or quite simple, I'm sorry. Uh, on the left side of the screen, we have uh, portable applications uh, that we wanted to get from one uh, environment on hardware to new hardware. Um, and uh, we did not want to address avionics networking. Uh, there are many other standards bodies that are working those 
aspects. We wanted to focus on the actual software uh, that does the um, actual capabilities or functions that we need it to do. And I'll get more detail as we go through. So what is the FACE architecture? Um, as I mentioned, it's a computing environment uh, that will enable product lines for, for military aviation or any other software product line development. Uh, we've uh, established a set of places or segments uh, where we have points of variance. Um, inside those segments, there is design uh, flexibility as long as you meet the boundaries, uh, the requirements of those segments and the boundaries uh, of those segments are bounded by uh, robustly defined interfaces. Um, the, we have uh, vertical interfaces uh, that are defined in the standard, um, such as operating system interface, the input-output interface, and the transport services interface. The operating system interface is based off of two uh, readily available standards, the POSIX standard, uh, as well as the ARINC 653 standard. Uh, the I.O. interface is a very simple, uh, normalized interface um, that I'll talk about in the following slide, as is the transport services interface. The horizontal interface is uh, standardized in the way data moves um, throughout this system. Originally, we bounded this system is within the skin of an aircraft, but it could be within the um, partitions of one operating system or between two box or inside one box or uh, between multiple boxes. But again, as I said, we're not trying to standardize the communication pathway between aircraft uh, networking or those types of things. Um, we wanted to focus on the software architecture itself. So what were the uh, barriers that we were trying to solve? Portability is what we wanted to do. Uh, reusability is the goal. The first step is making sure the software is portable. Uh, so on the left side of the screen, traditionally, um, we would expect software developers to get a list of their givens uh, that included what display am I outputting my data to, uh, what hardware am I running on, what operating system am I running on, what bus am I transmitting data on, uh, are there any other software components that I'm tightly coupled to? And all of these things would govern um, uh, the way I wrote my software, and typically I would embed all of those uh, specific um, functions into my software. The challenge with that is anytime one of those things would change, then I would have to rewrite a portion or all of my software and have to potentially retest all of it. So um, we categorize those concerns as presentation concerns, input-output concerns, input output concerns, and uh, operating system and driver concerns. Uh, the dependency on other software we can manage as well. So to make, to deal with those challenges, what we did in the FACE architecture is basically identify those concerns and we would mitigate them with creating adaptation layers to deal with those so that we could isolate the green uh, square on the screen, which if you can see is the business logic uh, or the algorithm that we really want to reuse um, and leverage the, um, uh, the investment on that uh, critical capability. We'll talk more in detail about what those adaptations are, but what these allow is that when the display changes, I just change the adaptation software to the display, not the business logic. If my uh, bus that I'm running data on changes, then I change the adaptation layer to that bus. If the operating system changes, um, it doesn't matter because I am uh, standardizing on a strict set of uh, operating system interfaces that all of the operating systems that are participating in the consortium provide. Um, and then any, adapt any dependency on any other software uh, would be standardized by the use of our horizontal interface to make sure that the information is being exchanged in a standard way. So this is a uh, picture of the uh, FACE architectural segments, uh, plus a couple of extras. I'll try to use the annotation uh, function on this uh, uh, display to help me. I'll start from the bottom. So uh, at the bottom, this is outside of the FACE architecture. The FACE architecture is bounded by the dashed lines, the heavy dashed lines in the screen. At the bottom is uh, hardware. Um, hardware has multiple meanings. In the case that we're talking about, we're talking about platform devices. 
sensors, effectors, radars, radios, uh, input-output devices, uh, those types of things. Um, the next step up is interface hardware. When we talk about interface hardware, the examples are listed in there. Uh, MIL standard 1553 bus, Ethernet, a ring 429, discrete ways that we're going to transmit data across hardware boundaries. Uh, both of these things um, have uh, are implemented in non-standard ways and typically output data in non-standard ways, whether the data from the sensors or effectors are proprietary in nature uh, or the implementation of the standard uh, interface hardware is implemented not exactly the same. Because we've recognized this from the experience of the multiple companies in the consortium, we, need, we realized we had to figure out a way to deal with this change and isolate the change from our, um, uh, our algorithms or business logic that I talked about on the previous slide. The first step is obviously the operating system, which is indicated by the L shape, the gray L shape on this. The operating system provides uh, many features uh, that uh, any software system would require, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, the standard things such as file systems, network stack, uh, as well as uh, access to the device drivers that are on the actual hardware uh, in uh, the, on the processor. Um, so what we see is that we define an operating system interface in the green line that's up the left side of the, um, um, the diagram. And this is going to provide those execution services for all software in every segment. In some cases, the operating system can be used for communication, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The next step, though, is the input-output service uh, segment. The intent of the input-output service segment is to normalize the um, implementation of the interface hardware that I discussed down here. So the point here is that if I have one manufacturer of a um, MIL standard 1553 card and another manufacturer, they might slightly implement the standards slightly differently. And because of that, the outputs will not be quite the same. So the purpose of the um, IO service is to take that uh, proprietary uh, implementation and normalize that so that all the data is passed through the input-output interface in a normalized fashion. Um, the calls are very standard and very simple here. Input, up, um, open, close, read, write, send, receive. Um, and then there's a standard uh, uh, message um, format that the data is put into that is defined in the standard. The key part of the I.O. service is that it does not understand the data. Its only purpose is to take the data from the interface hardware, put it into a standard envelope, and pass it through a normalized interface. What this allows is that if I change from one vendor 1553 card to another, I only have to replace this component, and I don't have to replace any of the other software in the system. So moving up the stack, the next uh, segment that the FACE uh, uh, architecture defines is the platform-specific services segment. Uh, as in its title, this still has some specificity uh, and is not um, completely isolated from the outside world. Um, we'll talk about a few sub-segments. The first one is the platform device services uh, sub-segment. And the primary role of this device or this service is to take the data from a sensor, um, analyze that ICD, and transform that data into a standard format that's defined by the FACE standard. Um, this allows this service to take this um, information it receives from the I.O. service that it received from the bus that received it from the sensor and convert that into data that the rest of the software and the system can understand in a standardized fashion. This also allows for ability to control some basic uh, controls of that um, sensor or effector. Um, but what this also allows is if I have a sensor 
uh, such as a GPS device, and I will go from one vendor to another, I can replace that GPS device. I only have to change this piece of software, not the input-output service or the other software that would consume the data from that. Again, the intent of the face architecture is to isolate change uh, away from our valuable algorithms or business logic at the top of the stack. <clears throat> the um, other sub-segment in the platform-specific services is platform common services, which includes uh, things such as health monitoring, fault management, configuration services. <coughs> FACE does not define uh, the requirements for these. It defines the requirements on where to put these in the architecture so that you don't inadvertently tie your business logic uh, to health monitoring, fault management, or system level configuration. You can isolate that by creating a separate component um, that if you change your requirements of your monitoring or your configuration, it does not affect your portable application. The third uh, sub-segment in the platform specific services is graphic services. Uh, we realize that many graphic services are closely tied to their drivers, such as OpenGL, um, and we did not want to add additional layers of interfaces or processing, as well as sometimes there's some latency challenges with graphics. So we identified a way to deal with that and, in, and um, identify the uh, graphics interfaces that they're allowed to use and in, in some cases go direct to the, to the, um, the graphics driver. Moving up, uh, once the uh, data has come through any of the components here that needs to go to be consumed by my business logic, it will go through the transport services interface. Transport services interface is, again, another normalized interface, very simple, open, close, read, write, send, receive, and callback. Uh, seven basic functions um, that are the syntactic interface, but now we introduce the face um, data model or type-specific interface um, that actually sends model data that understands the semantics. We have a semantic interface of the data. So from this point forward, all the software not only uh, has a standardized interface syntactically, but also a semantic understanding of the data. Transport services has some mandatory requirements uh, in these uh, to provide the services. It needs to provide routing and configuration at a minimum, but it also has some uh, conditional requirements um, that are available, and we provide requirements on how to implement them in a standard way, but you are not required to implement them in all cases. Things like data conversion, uh, data marshalling, uh, quality of service, and those are all system level requirements depending on your integration. Uh, what the FACE standard has done is defined where to put that uh, information in your architecture so that you do not inadvertently put that information in your valuable business logic so that you have to change your business logic if you port it to another system. On the other side of transport services is the transport services interface. So just the way we've drawn this diagram as a layered, it's going to depict this way. I have a slide on the next slide that will uh, depict it a different way. I show it only as one interface. But that goes to our portable component, and our portable component, of course, will take this inf information. It only has an interface to, that it only has to speak to the transport interface, and it only has to speak to uh, use the OS interface. And other than that, this is where it provides industry that uh, valuable innovation that they can create all of their uh, excellent innovation and capabilities in these capabilities. Because we've standardized in layers, uh, there are industry middleware makers that can, can compete in the transport services layer, and there are uh, sensor and effector developers that can provide their platform-specific services that accompany their devices that they sell, and there are interface bus hardware developers that can provide uh, input-output service um, with their components to further allow their cap uh, capabilities to be integrated using the FACE architecture. This is another picture of the FACE architecture. It is exactly the same architecture, just drawn differently. We ha and this one has a few uh, examples, and I'll very quickly summarize my previous conversation with a little bit of a data flow. 
So using a GPS as an example, I want to get GPS data displayed onto my display. So I start with a GPS device. It outputs its proprietary data onto the MIL standard 1553 bus, which has been integrated on a 1553 drive, um, card that has been pr produced by company A. That has a driver that the operating system interfaces with. We will write an I.O. service that takes the proprietary implementation of 1553, normalize that data into a standardized envelope and pass it through a normalized interface, uh, I.O. interface to a platform device service up in the platform specific services. This is where that data is, is interpreted using the um, GPS's ICD and transformed into a standard uh, face data architecture um, and passed through the transport services interface to the transport service. Transport service through configuration knows that that data needs to go to application one. Application one will consume it. It will conduct its calculations and output data through the transport services back to transport um, transport services interface back to transport services. They will route it to platform specific services graphics to be output up displayed on a GPU driver and then out to the actual display itself. So in each case, every time any one of those things changes in the loop, we have the ability to just isolate the change at each of the segments, thus keeping our portable applications portable. Uh, as we go down the stack, there's a little bit less portability, but if you are tied to the same hardware in all cases, then your software should be portable with that same hardware. This is a slide that just summarizes uh, kind of the bounding of each of the, what we're calling unit supportability. Uh, you also see in the face standard units of conformance, which is what Steve's going to talk about, but basically a unit of portability is equivalent to a unit of conformance. Uh, it's just uh, um, a little bit easier for folks to say of how I'm going to uh, make it portable. But for instance, in the PCS and portable component segment, it has to conform to the transport service interface and the operating system segment interfaces, which include operating system interface or a programming language runtime or a, a framework interface. Uh, for the transport service segment components, they have to conform to the operating system segment interfaces. And the interesting part about transport services, it provides the transport service interface. So that's the other interface it still has to conform to by ensuring that it provides the transport services interface to its consumers. For the platform specific services segment components, they need to conform to the, not only the transport service interface, but also the input output service interface. That's the reason that we put um, uh, health monitoring, system level health monitoring and system level configuration services in that segment so that they would have access to all interfaces uh, within the software uh, system, as well as they need to comply with the operating system segment interface. All right. I mentioned a little bit about face data architecture. Um, it's a very robust um, uh, endeavor that we've added. Uh, so there's a strong meta model uh, in the face standard and it's uh, robustly documented. Uh, but essentially what we are doing is we are creating a platform independent model um, standardized uh, with rigorous mathematical models to make sure it's verifiable. And what we're trying to do is capture the semantic understanding of the data. Um, ICDs have done a great job in the past, but they are uh, only as good as the people who are available to interpret them. Uh, by capturing the information robustly into a semantic data model, uh, util utilizing these um, OMG uh, model-driven architecture principles, uh, we can utilize all of this to create auto transformations if we have independent development of uh, messaging. So I'll very quickly go through this. But the conceptual data model is basically conceptual views of information um, that, uh, uh, that are not platform specific at all, air, sky, vehicle, those types of things. We'll utilize data refinement um, and step down to the logical data model view 
uh, where we start talking about observables and measure, measurements that we can apply and give more context to those conceptual views. Uh, this can project a message. And then when we move to the platform specific model, we can add in specific information related to our aircraft itself or our system itself, and this can actually create the message. Uh, we document the entire um, tree and the message in a unit of portability supplied model um, that is delivered with our software. That model can be uh, can generate the actual code for the interfaces in uh, using IDL, and we have IDL2 uh, language binding mappings uh, that can then be used in our uh, integration with our software. So every unit of portability or uh, unit of conformance um, it, from the piece portable component segment and the platform specific services segment um, will have one of these delivered with it um, to provide that semantic understanding of the data that that component requires. And because we're talking about conformance, that's the data that we need to uh, send. Transport Services API provides the structure in which to send it. So everything in green and blue are required. Um, sorry, this purple is also kind of uh, hard to see, but those are required. Um, and then red and orange are optional. Um, Optional requirements don't sound like they're standard, but the reason they're optional is because these are system level decisions and uh, face conformance is done at the component level. So uh, based on my system, I'm going to develop a component. And if my system requires quality of service um, requirements, then I'm going to put those quality of service requirements in the transport services component that I'm developing. And I will add the associated associations that are required. Um, so. Um, we are providing not only the data model, but the structure in which it's sent over the Transport Services API. All of this is testable. I will talk about uh, a little bit about conformance testing. Uh, the data model, uh, we have a conformance test suite that tests for the data model by uh, verifying that it is constructed to the face meta model that's defined in the standard. It's in a standard XMI format. Um, it also verifies that it is compared against the uh, face shared data model, which is a um, configuration managed uh, list of basis elements at the conceptual and logical level. Uh, it, this conformance test suite will also generate the data types from that um, UOP supplied model and verify that the data types that are provided in there are the only data types that are used by the unit of conformance that's under test. So four very rigorous tests that the conformance test suite does on the data, as well as the conformance test suite will also test that uh, unit of conformance for the interfaces that I mentioned, either the transport interface, input-output interface, or operating system interface. So in summary, um, FACE is getting uh, capabilities to the warfighter faster at a lower cost by increasing portability and thus uh, reusability. Uh, the documentation is being designed through an industry government collaboration, which ensures that um, both, both are reaping the benefits that Judy talked about at the onset of this brief. And then the technical standard is being considered for all defense avionics software procurement, procurements where reuse is a goal and commercial industry is also looking at it uh, and has already started to address it. Um, the FACE initiative is addressing business concerns that have hampered other OA initiatives, such as conformance program. Uh, without a strict conformance program, you can't ensure uh, implementation across the board, and we are very excited about having uh, our program being stood up. So, Opus, before you before you move on, and uh, we introduce Steve Getz to get into the uh, the details about the conformance program and the process that software suppliers would go through. I do have a question from the the Q and A chat. Sure. So, are conformance tools open source, and are there plugins for standard tools such as Eclipse IDE? 
Uh, so the conformance tools are open source. They can be downloaded from the Open Group website, and there's one for each version of the standard. There's actually multiple versions for each version of the standard, and it's not intended to cause confusion. Uh, but the consortium identified that there would be contractual limitations, and then we didn't want um, a vendor to be um, unfairly constrained by um, they went on contract and version one of the tool was available and by the end of their contract, version five is available. Uh, we didn't want to force them to have to go to version five unless they had to negotiate that with their customer. So all versions of the tool are available to them. Uh, it is expected to use the most current version if possible, but those are all available. They are not tied to a specific IDE. They are done in a generic a modeling environment. Uh, and they have the ability to be uh, run on Linux and uh, Windows. Any other questions, okay. Judy? Uh, no, that was the only one that came through. So I appreciate that very much. And uh, with that, we will now uh, switch gears and introduce uh, Mr. Steve Getz uh, from U.S. Army MRDAC. Uh, to give us more information about the actual conformance processes, uh, where to get information about the conformance process, conformance documentation, and uh, how to go about going through uh, the various steps of uh, verification, certification, and registration to get FACE software completely certified and listed in the registry. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Steve Getz. Thanks, Judy. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I, am I running slides? I am. Okay. So that's me, Steve Getz, um, and I'm looking that we have 75 attendees, so I wasn't nervous until just now. Um, but anyway, my, my intent here is, first of all, to provide an overview of the FACE Conformance Program, and we'll step through that in some detail. Uh, not a huge deep dive because we, we just don't have the time, uh, but I will describe, you know, the policies and procedures and, and some recommendations that, that are made uh, in, in getting through the uh, FACE Conformance Program and getting uh, uh, ultimately certified and listed on the registry. Uh, the key takeaway I'd like to stress right here at the beginning is that I'm going to highlight uh, some references and available sources. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned. I'm going to mention them again because I think they're that important and because they're already in my slides. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll jump right in. So here's a very high-level uh, view of the conformance program and its associated three processes uh, being verification, certification, and registration. And we'll talk more about the content of that slide, but uh, this, this diagram has been affectionately referred to as the perfect diagram. Uh, uh, and since I was involved in its construction, I have no argument. But the next slide uh, is what we call the more perfect diagram. Uh, and in that, you'll notice on the top left, we added a step of conduct preparation. And while that's not an official uh, part of the FACE conformance program, it is, in fact, so critical. And that's uh, what we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about as we get through the rest of these, uh, this presentation. Uh, if we don't get down to your question, then at the end uh, we'll have some time where uh, I'll certainly do our, we'll do our best to, to get you an answer. And if we don't have it, I'm sure we can follow up with it later. Um, while we're on this, uh, this diagram, what I wanted to do was uh, just talk about uh, the flow uh, from the top left uh, of the software supplier. Uh, and let me just describe a software supplier is someone who supplies software, and that sounds a little silly, but what that means is it might be the system integrator, it might be the subsystem integrator, it is not necessarily the person who was the software developer, but who actually supplies the software uh, that's, that's assessed for uh, face conformance. So there's the role of the software supplier, and they remain in control of stepping through this process, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we move along. So uh, once you uh, get through preparation, uh, you would initiate verification, and that's done uh, through an authority called a face verification authority. 
we have multiple VAs as they're uh, addressed. Uh, two are from government, one Army, one Navy, uh, and two are from industry, from CERTON and Tucson Embedded Systems currently, uh, and we are expecting more. They are uh, assessed by a VA approval committee uh, to make sure that they meet muster, and they as assert that they will uh, remain current and qualified, and they are in fact uh, an expert on the FACE technical standards and the associated verification methods, uh, by which there are two, and Opus touched on this slightly, we, we use test and we use inspection or a combination of, of those two. Um, but they will, they will do the, the testing and inspection of the submitted software, uh, known as a unit of conformance, and its associated uh, verification evidence. Um, from there, if the software supply, once they pass, if the software supplier chooses to do so, they can proceed uh, to certification. Um, we have one and only one certification authority, and the certification authority uh, uh, reviews some documentation received from the VA and from the software supplier, make sure that it uh, meets the requirements for that paperwork, and then uh, will issue the uh, conformance certificate uh, associated with that unit of conformance. Uh, from there, the software supplier, again, has a choice to register on the FACE registry, and that's done by uh, addressing the, the library administrator, of which there's one. Um, the library administrator will look at the descriptions that are offered for the UOC, uh, check back with the certification authority to make sure that a certificate has been issued for the for the UOC that wants to be listed, and then it can be pushed up on the registry. And the registry is a very important part of this process and program. Uh, it is the uh, listing of only face certified UOCs. So if if they haven't completely met conformance and it's binary, you either pass completely or you do not, uh, you will be unable to be listed on the registry. And uh, to do that, you also must must go through certification. So. so the next slide, and Judy showed, I think, the same slide, but again, I wanted to, to mention it because it's so important, is the face landing page. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on what's available related to conformance, but uh, if you are not familiar with the FACE uh, consortium and its architecture and its approach, uh, there's a lot of other information available through this landing page. So this, this website here, uh, if you haven't put it in your favorites or your bookmarks yet, I would, I would recommend that if you want to proceed with the, with the FACE approach. Uh, so the next shot here is drilling down to the conformance tab of the face landing page. And this is where, again, you get, a, get the uh, pleasure of viewing the more perfect diagram. Uh, but also there are, are four tabs there, uh, starting on the left, where you can get conformance publications uh, ranging from the conformance policy. We have a conformance certification guide. You can download the uh, related conformance verification, excuse me, matrices. Uh, you can download the, uh, the test tools, and all of these things are freely available. This, there's no secret to this stuff. We tell you the standard. We let you test yourself before you get there because we want to populate that registry with conformant uh, units of conformance and, and really make this uh, approach a success. Uh, the next tab is conformance guidance, and what that tab does is step you through uh, the preparation phase, the verification process, the certification process, and finally the registration process. Um, our uh, conformance certification guide that I mentioned uh, previously uh, has recently been published, and our goal is to get that linked directly through the steps in this conformance guidance. We're not there yet, but our, our uh, the conformance subcommittee that I'm a member of uh, is working hard to continually improve this landing page and this tab uh, to help the software supplier and integrator or whomever 
uh, understand and get through uh, the face conformance program and processes. Uh, the third tab there with the green check mark on it is a link to conformance authorities. I mentioned them before. We have verification authorities and we have one certification authority. Um, the links there, uh, as you drill down, will provide contact information to our current four verification authorities and also directly to our certification authority. <laughs> Excuse me. And then lastly, we have uh, a tab for frequently asked questions, uh, just ones that have continual, continually bubbled up either at face-to-face -face meetings or through events such as this webinar. Uh, and then also there is a conformance term and definition listing there. So if you, you know, have a question uh, regarding, you know, face terminology, uh, hopefully it'll be answered there. Okay. So now as we're going to step through the preparation and then the other three official steps of conformance uh, in a little more detail, uh, uh, and it may spur some questions, which we'll do our best to answer uh, once I get through these slides. So the role of software supplier there on the left, of course, uh, it's very important to obtain your references and your tools. Uh, uh, the reference repository, also known as the Open Group Bookstore, can be accessed via the face landing page, uh, via the conformance tab. You can Google it. There's a bunch of ways to get to this stuff, and we are absolutely not trying to hide it. We are trying to get it available. If we had a mailing list, I, you know, I, I would think see, people would send it out. But uh, by all means, get these documents, uh, you know, read through them. Um, I am not a software developer, but I'm told that this is not building rockets. While it may fly on aircraft, it is straightforward uh, and, uh, you know, can be the, the standards and the, the technical requirements in the technical standard are not new. They are certainly being, you know, uh, driven, as Opus said, uh, through specific interfaces and then some control of the development inside the segments, but, uh, you know, it's, it, we're not inventing things here uh, to make this difficult. We are trying to ensure portability and reuse. Uh, so you have your references. Uh, the next thing uh, that is recommended to do in preparation is to reach out to one of those verification authorities and establish a relationship, and there's really two relationships that are there. Uh, one is a legal relationship. There's a, uh, a verification uh, agreement between the software supplier and that VA uh, that, you know, sets out what will be performed by the VA, how many times would it be performed before it would be renegotiated if there's trouble, difficulties, um, also what type of evidence needs to be provided and what methods would be used to, to exchange that information and provide feedback. Um, that's done on an individual basis by each VA. The consortium doesn't get in that business. Um, if there are issues, we certainly want to be aware of them and we will do our best to address them, but uh, those VAs are independent authorities. Uh, however, without the approval of the consortium, they, they can't perform the verification role. Uh, the other relationship between the software supplier and the VA is really the, the the technical relationship, the working back and forth to ensure that uh, they get a successful verification of the submitted software or that unit of conformance that was addressed earlier. Um, and, and the unit of conformance is the element that, it, that face conformance is based upon. Uh, and it can range from an operating system to a portable segment component. Uh, some may be very small. Uh, an example I'd offer is just something that keeps time uh, to an OS, which you can imagine uh, is, is a much larger block of software. So uh, one of the questions that, that comes up frequently is, well, how much is verification going to cost? Uh, and the answer that I, that I give, and it may not be popular, is, well, it depends. And it depends on how big uh, the, the unit of conformance is, how many there are, 
uh, how well prepared the evidence is when the software supplier provides it to the VA. So this is where that relationship and that communication is critical. Uh, so as that goes on, uh, then the software supplier uh, on the third uh, oval in, in that square on the left, uh, or in that shape on the left, would develop their unit of conformance. Uh, there's lots of references on how to do that. Certainly the technical standard is a, is a key one. There's a reference implementation guide, and there's more help on the way. Um, so uh, certainly a doable process. So um, the next step then is to establish a library portal profile, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the library portal here in just a second. That was a quick second. Okay, so here's the second uh, uh, website address uh, URL that, that I would recommend you note, and I'm um, my understanding is, of course, this webinar will be available, but I think these slides will also be uh, available. Um, and so this library portal uh, has two major parts to it. One is it houses the FACE uh, registry. Uh, again, the registry is the public, uh, open to the public listing of conformant units of conformance that are available uh, through the representatives that are listed there. It, it does not house software. You don't download your app from this registry. What you do is you obtain the, the, the description of the application or the UOC and then a point of contact and how to get to them to negotiate uh, obtaining one of these units of conformance. Again, they won't be on the registry if they haven't passed muster uh, all the way through verification and certification. Um, and then the other piece, which is the UOC management. And this can be used by software suppliers starting from verification all the way uh, through registration. And we'll talk about which steps are required and which ones are optional. Okay, so I'm going to show a series of DODEF diagrams, uh, and, and these, these particular ones are called OV5Bs, and it all sounds, at least to me, it's a little intimidating to talk about DODEF diagrams and, and their particulars, and this, these diagrams can, in fact, look a little busy, but please don't let them scare you. Again, uh, this stuff is not rocket science. We just wanted to be able to provide a logical step through uh, if you think back to the perfect or more perfect diagram, that encompasses really the major pieces of the face conformance program. But uh, as we look at this, uh, we can see that, you know, the software supplier uh, who hopefully during preparation established that relationship with the verification authority submits uh, their software verification package, which contains some paperwork contains some uh, compiled object code for the test environment and some instructions on how that was made and how it would run with the test suites. So the verification authority can do that. Uh, there's certainly room for back and forth. The verification authority performs the assessment uh, through inspection of the design documents and information provided uh, and then conducts the for the record test using the uh, FACE approved test suite. Again, the software supplier has full access to that exact same test suite so that, you know, there should be no surprises. Um, they perform the evaluation. If there are some issues, then there's some back and forth. Uh, feedback is provided. All this is done, uh, first of all, in accordance with the FACE cons uh, consortium's policies and processes, but also in accordance with that verification agreement that the software supplier and the VA have entered into. Uh, once uh, assuming the UOC passes, uh, then the VA would uh, create the verification results package, provide that back to the software supplier, and then the VA also archives that data in a element of the FACE library called the Verification Retention Repository. Uh, and that's there uh, just in case of audit 
or uh, other need to to check either on that particular software or and what was assessed or uh, in case the VA should come up under audit. Okay, so there's verification. So the next step then again is certification and again the software supplier controls the timing and, and initiation of all these steps. Uh, if you know contractually you have a timeline to meet, you'll have to you know pl back plan that. But if, especially if it's perhaps an IRAD development, or if you want, if a software supplier wanted to hold announcement of a particular unit of conformance uh, for for marketing reasons, or or make it at a at a uh, unveiling of a product or something. That could be done, and it's again under the software supplier's control. Um, so, so the software supplier reaches out to the certification authority, uh, and in this case, uh, let me back up just a second on a thought on verification. Um, while it's not mandatory, that library portal uh, account that we mentioned a few slides ago uh, can be used to help step through verification. To, uh, to exchange uh, information, to uh, obtain references, and that sort of thing. However, it is not mandatory. But once we move into the certification, then the library portal tool must be used. That's the uh, method of, of submitting information to the certification authority by the software supplier. Uh, the certification authority, again, there's only one. Uh, is, is goes into that library portal, uh, looks at the, the documents provided, reaches back to the verification authority to ensure that that unit of conformance did in fact uh, uh, pass verification. Uh, assuming that all things are in order, uh, they create a conformance certificate and that's issued to the software supplier and a bit of information uh, that was submitted along with that certificate uh, is uh, put into the certification retention repository uh, for safekeeping. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention here is that there is an agreement between the software supplier and the certification authority uh, that, uh, as Judy mentioned, part of being certified is that they, the software supplier warrants that their unit of conformance uh, not only meets uh, conformance to the to the uh, face technical standard, but will continue to meet it. So if an issue is found, uh, the software supplier e either needs to repair and correct that issue, or their cert uh, their certificate will be pulled. And so that's in that certification agreement, and uh, that's exposed early on. So there's you know it's no gotcha to that uh, as as you proceed through this. You know, it's it's explained very clearly in our guide and in several other documents. Okay, our last step uh, is conformance registration. Again, this is done through that library portal through the library administrator who runs the registry. Um, the software supplier uh, through that tool once uh, you know applies for registration. Uh, can list a product description of their UOC, so it's a free text field along with some established metadata that help describe that product, that UOC, for anyone who's looking at the registry. Um, the library administrator, once they receive the request, will reach back to the certification authority just to ensure that uh, the UOC uh, that, wants to, that they're desiring to have listed did in fact receive a conformance certificate. They verify that. The library administrator uh, receives that verification and reviews the posting and then pushes it up onto the FACE registry. Uh, the FACE registry, again, this is another one I would certainly stress is very important. This is the public access viewing of your product, your conformant UOC, uh, and this is where uh, project managers and and system developers are going to go look for these existing UOCs and understand that they have the pedigree of having been through this fair conformance program and received uh, certification. So uh, 
really important to to follow it through all the way till the end. Okay, so did we get everything perfect? Absolutely, but what if there's an issue? Okay, uh, the, conf the FACE Consortium has a uh, problem reporting and change request ticketing system. Uh, another website there listing. Uh, hopefully you won't need it, but if you do, it's there. Uh, it's, it's a step-through tool where you can submit an issue, uh, either a question or if you think you found an error or something uh, or something missing from, let's say, the conformance policy or one of the technical standards, it can be put in there. It, it will be triaged and addressed and feedback will be provided. Uh, the answer may just be an explanation. Uh, it may be, hey, we've already dealt with this one. Or if it's a valid issue, it will certainly be addressed in, in, in an uh, uh, efficient manner and a thorough manner. Um, the problem reporting is actually uh, specific to conformance, and that is if there's an issue uh, that's valid that is uh, preventing a software supplier getting their UOC through uh, the conformance program, uh, that goes through an expedited process and a, an item called an approved correction can be uh, developed allowing uh, verification to be completed uh, and then as documents and tools or what have you are updated, those approved corrections would be rolled into those uh, tools and documents to make sure that uh, you know, any issue that was found uh, is corrected. Okay, if that doesn't work, if it all gets messed up or there's questions or there's disagreements that can't be solved in conformance, uh, there is an appeals process and uh, the submitter possibly and most likely the software supplier, but it may be a verification authority might appeal something. Um, and it goes to the FACE Consortium Steering Committee uh, and they will review the appeal and make a decision uh, either yes the appeal is approved and changes will be made or it's denied no changes made and that is the final decision uh, should there be a problem uh, we are not advocating them and are not <laughs> anticipating them but we do have a plan if they should occur um, so that's a high-level walkthrough, and I certainly wanted to leave some time for questions. Uh, but I, again, I wanted to walk through the, the process, uh, provide the links, uh, describe the roles, policies, and some procedures, and uh, at this point, certainly uh, call you all to action as software suppliers, especially to get your product certified, get a, get the base registry populated and let's continue to make the FACE initiative uh, a success. And so I think, I know that's the end of my slides, and I think Judy uh, is now when we move to the Q&A section, so. Yes, I have at least two questions. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, you sound good, Judy. Okay, very good. Okay, so the first question, um, as the FACE standard matures or changes, Will there be updated conformance standards that will require suppliers to develop new UOCs and re-verify through a VA, or is the goal to maintain backwards compatibility? And either Steve or Marcel, I'll, uh, I'll defer to you guys to answer that question as, as you feel the need. Hey, Marcel, let me take the first part, because I like taking the easy part. <laughs> so. So conformance of a UOC is to a specific edition of the technical standard. Um, so if, so that uh, conformance certificate will list uh, which technical standard, which version of the test suite was used to test it, uh, and so it's tied to that. Um, if, if a software supplier wants to be certified conformant to a follow-on standard or perhaps a preceding standard, they would have to go through a separate verification and certification for that particular edition of the tech standard and utilize the test tool that's uh, a link to that. Uh, and then, so that I, I think that answers that question. Uh, and let me, I don't want to put you on the spot, Marcel, but the, I think you'd do a better job on the backwards compatible part. 
Yeah, so there's two there's two pieces to this. Um, so the face architecture that I described is an abstraction and interface standard. So there's two ways to look at this. I, um, if I am taking a software components designed to edition 2.1 of the standard and I want to integrate it into a system that's using edition 3.0 of the standard, um, there is an adaptation uh, opportunity to deal with that change uh, utilizing the requirements of the new standard. Um, so we can mitigate that. So rather than taking that 2.1 uh, component, I may not have to actually change it. I may be able to interface with it. Um, however, um, if there are some other things or there's a business desire to migrate it, uh, then you would um, have, probably have to do some rework to do that. To mitigate how much rework, um, the technical working group maintains backwards compatibility matrices between uh, um, going forward from 2.1 and going forward. So that um, if someone wants to go from 2.1 with their component to 3.0, they are aware of any potential impacts that may have happened. In many cases, though, the guidance and goals and objectives of the technical working group is not to make the um, ensuing standards more restrictive, but rather uh, extend them. So um, while a 3.0 a component may not go to 2.1, the intent is that older versions would more easily be integrated into uh, newer versions of the standard or, new, or systems that incorporate components from newer um, editions of the standard. So it's kind of, we're trying to hit it all, all, all sides, like uh, Steve mentioned on the conformance side, but on the technical side, we're trying to minimize impact as much as possible. Okay, thank you both. And I have one more question. Um, what are the kinds of cases where a supplier with a verified UOC would fail to be certifiable? Can that happen? Uh, so this is Steve Getz, and, and um, I'll take that one because I take the easy ones. So, <laughs> so it's possible. Uh, the, the certification step is uh, very non-technical. Uh, the certification authority is reviewing uh, basically four documents. The uh, software supplier's statement of conformance, and that's provided to the VA early on. And that is where the software supplier describes their unit of conformance and how they meet the requirements of the technical standard. So that one has been through a technical review. Uh, and then it is provided to the CA. Uh, there's also the ver uh, statement of verification, and that's where the VA, upon successful verification, fills out this PDF fillable document uh, and, and states that basically the environment in which the UOC was assessed uh, against which technical standard, using which test tool, uh, which uh, conditional requirements were involved, Involved and there's a, 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 a not with me, but there's certainly a short list of items that are annotated on that form. Uh, then there's the uh, certification agreement, uh, and that one's going to be there because uh, that uh, does two things. One, I mentioned it, it provides the warrant uh, by the software supplier that they uh, have conformance software and will maintain it as such. And it also ensures that the certification authority gets paid for doing their job, so that that won't be there. Uh, and I I know I meant I said four, and I'm coming up with three, and I can't come up with a fourth. But if you go to the guide, and it may only be three, I apologize, I'm I'm drawing a blank. Uh, so the the certification authority is going to make sure that those forms are uh, completely filled out, correctly filled out. Uh, an example I think that might be a little uh, possibility is perhaps a part number that's listed on the statement of verification versus what's listed on the software supplier's statement of conformance 
maybe a number gets transposed or something like that. That would be the type of thing I think that's that's possible could happen. But as far as uh, technical uh, issues being there, those are assessed during verification. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and I have one more question. I just need to find it. Give me a minute. So would it be more typical to certify a single UOC at a time or to certify a set of related UOCs that together provide a fully functional solution to some mission requirements? So we have a, a item concept, I'm not quite sure what to call it, called a UOC package, okay? Uh, and there's not particularly a technical reason for making a package of units of conformance, but there is likely a business decision in making that. Um, yeah, absolutely, if a, if a group of UOCs uh, complement each other and provide a, like you said, a mission capability, uh, then it makes sense to do that unit of conformance package. Uh, each UOC that comprises uh, that package has to be individually verified and certified, uh, and then a certificate can be issued for that package. Uh, the thought there is is that that would be listed, uh, could be listed individually certainly, but also it could be listed as a package on the registry so that if you as a provider wanted to, uh, you know, say, hey, I've got this greatest, uh, you know, capability that, you know, whatever makes time travel possible or the photon torpedo, that's something you want to get out there. There are uh, a couple of additional requirements to a UOC package, and basically um, you can't run from the top to the bottom on the uh, the architecture uh, because what we end up doing there is break in portability. So uh, during the assessment of that package, uh, it would be checked to make sure that it didn't violate the the rules. And there's a diagram and depiction in the in the uh, tech standard uh, that clearly lays out. Um, you know, which segments in combination can't be crossed. So I hope that answered that question. And and, and let me add one, one last thing. Uh, if you have a stack of UOCs that are not related that you want to push through all at once, there's no restriction on that either. Okay, thanks, Steve. I'm looking at one more question. Okay, so when a UOC is registered, does that include source code or is it just an executable? So when a UOC is registered, it includes no code. Um, it includes a description uh, of that UOC. Uh, there's some free text fields and again, there's a, a long list of, of metadata stuff and I, I wouldn't even pretend to be able to quote it to you, but uh, what what segment it resides in, what technical standard edition it was uh, uh, certified against or certified to, uh, things like that that the buyer is going to want to know, and then it's going to contain uh, email address, perhaps name, phone number, how do I get a hold of the software supplier who produced this great certified conformant UOC so I can purchase it or acquire it. Uh, so yeah, no code is stored in, in any of our, uh, in, in that uh, particular part of the library. The product repositories, which are maintained by the software suppliers, is where that uh, code would be housed. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I almost said brilliant because I'm on the I'm a, on the other side of the pond, but I'll I'll I, revert back I to my. I would have brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> okay, I have one more question that came in from the participants, and uh, is Phase 2.1 still the latest and greatest? 
and what is the status of Phase 3.0? Uh, phase 2.1 is the latest and greatest. 3.0 is on schedule to be published in summertime of 2017. Very good. And in response to the call to action, I do want to announce that as of uh, earlier this morning, it's probably earlier this week, but I've been on holiday most of the week, so I found out earlier this morning uh, that we do have our first a uh, certified face conformant UOC listed in the face registry. It is uh, Rockwell Collins missionized flight management software application. It is one of the portable components uh, in the face software stack and the reference architecture. And I'm very proud to announce that we have officially completed the launch of the face conformance program through investigation, verification, certification, registration, and we have our first face conformance software product listed in the face registry. So on that happy note, uh, if you have any more questions, either um, indicate them in the chat or indicate them in the Q&A. I do see something coming in in the Q&A. One more question. Let me just check. Is there a policy on who or how many accounts a software supplier can have? for the FACE library? And Steve, that might be a better question for you in the couple minutes that we have left. Uh, I, I'm i not aware of one, um, and I apologize. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know of a limitation, and I'm trying to understand why there might be one, but no, not, not, not to my knowledge. Um, Okay, so um, I do know the person who asked the question personally. Um, if you would send me an email with that same question in the uh, either the subject line or in the text, I can do some investigation. And if you're having difficulty on, on that type of information, I can do some investigation and find out for you. My understanding is that the accounts should be on uh, a role-based, so it could be either individual or it could be company-based, and I'll get more information and I will get back to you. So if you would uh, send me an email um, with that question, I can do an investigation and let you know. So in the like 30 seconds that we have before we switch from uh, 4 o'clock to 4.01, are there any final questions, parting words, closing thoughts from any Attendees, anyone on the panel uh, that you would like to uh, like to embellish? Going once, going twice. So with that, I would like to thank all of our attendees for, for participating today. Uh, very pleased with the turnout. I'd like to thank uh, Marcel Padilla from Navair and Steve Getz from U.S. Army Amerdeck. Uh, I'd like to say thank Simon uh, from uh, the Open Group staff, Mike Hickey from the Open Group staff uh, for participating and uh, keeping us in check. And with that, if you have any additional information, feel free to uh, send me an email, uh, j.sorenzia at opengroup.org. Uh, you can inquire for more information on www.opengroup.org slash face. And, uh, We'll look forward to hearing from you and look forward to seeing more of our members and non-members uh, submit for the uh, con certification process, conformance process and uh, see more certified conformance software populating our uh, face registry. Thank you so much for joining today and you have a good afternoon and a good evening. Thanks everyone.